The Rules Committee will come to order. We are here for consideration of H.R. 822, the National Right to Carry Reciprocity Act of 2011. We're happy to welcome the distinguished chairman of the Committee on the Judiciary. And uh, please come forward, uh, Chairman Smith. Uh, we're also anticipating that uh, Bobby Scott will be joining you uh, at the table. And so let me say that, uh, first of all, welcome back to all the uh, members of the uh, Rules Committee. I hope uh, everyone had a productive week. And um, we uh, have, as I think everyone who has looked at the schedule uh, is aware, a very, very busy schedule. We'll be meeting. Ms. Slaughter tried to convince me it was every day this week. We're planning to meet almost every day. It'll feel like it. It'll feel like it. We're going to meet today, tomorrow, and Wednesday. And we'll have a very full schedule going into Friday. So having said that, let me uh, again extend a welcome to uh, my good friend, Mr. Smith, and to say that without objection, any prepared statement that you have will appear in the record in its entirety, and we welcome your summary. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm going to give a brief statement, and then, of course, we'll be happy to answer questions. I appreciate the opportunity to testify today regarding H.R. 822, the National Right to Carry Reciprocity Act of 2011. H.R. 822 was introduced by Mr. Stearns of Florida and Mr. Schuler of North Carolina and is co-sponsored by 245 members from both sides of the aisle. The bill allows law-abiding gun owners with valid state-issued concealed firearms permits or licenses to carry a concealed firearm in any other state that also allows concealed carry. This legislation does not preempt a state's ability to set concealed carry requirements for its own residents. It requires states that currently permit people to carry concealed firearms to recognize other states' valid concealed carry permits much like the state's recognized driver's license issued by other states. H.R. 822 also does not affect state laws governing how firearms are carried or used within the various states. A person visiting another state must comply with all laws and regulations governing the carrying and use of a concealed firearm within that state. Studies show that carrying concealed weapons reduces violent crime rates by deterring would-be assailants and by allowing law-abiding citizens to defend themselves. A 1997 study published by John Lott and David Mustard regarding the effect of concealed carry laws on crime rates estimated that, quote, when state concealed handgun laws went into effect in a county, murders fell by more than 7 percent and rapes and aggravated assaults fell by similar percentages, end quote. The study has been replicated and the results confirmed by other scholars, some of whom found that the Lott and Mustard study underestimated the effect of concealed carry laws on violent crime rates. This bill simply allows Americans who travel to take their Second Amendment rights with them. Congress has previously passed laws to permit certain active duty and retired law enforcement officers to carry concealed weapons in other states. H.R. 822 extends the same ability to all law-abiding citizens. H.R. 822 was the subject of a legislative hearing by the Judiciary Committee's Crime Subcommittee and was considered and approved by the full committee on October 25th. I request that the Rules Committee grant an appropriate rule that allows for expeditious consideration of H.R. 822. Well, thank you uh, thank very you, much, Chairman. Uh, Chairman Smith, and thanks for your hard work on this. I, I'm impressed with one of the points that you made. There's nothing that imposes on a state that does not have a concealed carry measure, any kind of responsibility. I know there's been a lot of that, talk about that. That is recognition of states' rights is a very important provision right. that you have in this measure. Uh, this bill actually recognizes states' rights in two very uh, substantive and serious ways. Uh, the first is if a state has voted not to allow individuals to have a concealed carry permit, an individual cannot carry weapons or guns or firearms into that state. The only state that is in that category is the state of Illinois, so no one would be able to carry weapons into that state. Uh, another way it respects state rights is because if a state, for example, does not allow a concealed carry permit holder in their state to, say, go into a public building, go into a bar, go to a sporting event uh, with a firearm, an individual coming from out of state cannot do any of those things either. So it respects both local and state laws in regard to concealed carry permits. Thank you very much, and, uh, and, and we appreciate that. Mr. Sessions? Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Chairman Smith, thank you uh, for appearing before the Rules Committee today. Thank you. I'm very excited about this bill. This has been talked about uh, since I've been in Congress, and I'm sure a long time before. I've been a co-sponsor of this uh, effort and strongly support it. Uh, the facts that you presented about that evidently from Mr. John Lott, who is an author, 
who speaks about our ability to protect ourselves as a as a I think a right that we have, but with the profound effect upon crime, a deterrence to crime. Uh, do you have any more information about that? Because I, I really do believe that we found in Texas that at the time we did this, literally crime went down. Right. Uh, crime typically goes down 6 to 7 percent um, whenever a state has implemented a concealed carry, allowed a concealed carry permit. Uh, what I also want to emphasize, you asked if there was any additional information. There have actually been 18 studies that have showed that the crime rate has dropped and dropped precipitously when a concealed carry permit was allowed in that state. There have been zero studies indicating that the crime rate has increased. Well, this is once again an, an indication to me of how important, uh, as you characterize it, being able to carry forth your constitutional rights, especially the Second Amendment, where you, where you go. I, I think the one question which I missed is, if, if a state does not have, or Washington, D.C., does not have this ability, how does, how does this bill treat Well, if the that? state or uh, Washington, D.C., which does not allow an individual, affirmatively does not allow an individual to have a concealed carry, then the, the reciprocity would not hold in those cases, uh, and you would be recognizing either D.C. rights or state rights. They would not have to allow someone in to cross their uh, borders uh, with a concealed carry. Well, to me, that shows great respect uh, for others, and which I think is what the, this bill is about, is respecting everybody's not only constitutional right, but also those legislative intent uh, where those bodies have spoken. So I'll be in full support of this bill, and I appreciate you. Thank you, Mr. Yeah. Thank you very much. Mr. Scott, we uh, have already begun the questioning. If you'd like Thank to you. offer uh, how, some, uh, some comments. I would we, just again, um, my, ask for my statement to be placed in the record. It'll be included in the record without objection. follow up this question. Did I understand him to say that if you have an out-of-state permit, and go in another state, you have to comply with the regulations in that state, even though you're not entitled to a permit in that state? Uh, no. If a state, for example, if I may respond. Please, absolutely. From Virginia. Well, this is a discussion uh, that you and I just had. Right. It is. Uh, there is one state that I'm aware of, and only one state, in addition to the District of Columbia, where there has been an affirmative decision made not to issue concealed carry permits. And under this bill, you would not be allowed to take firearms into those jurisdictions. That's correct. But if you, if you um, live in one state and are not qualified to get a concealed weapons permit in your state and want to go to another state to get a concealed weapons permit, you can use that concealed weapons permit anywhere except your home state. You right. can, you can um, run around the country even though you are not entitled to get a, get a permit and even though the state you're, you, you go to wouldn't let you get a concealed permit because of convictions you've got or some other reason. Uh, Mr. Chairman, may I respond to that? Um, you have a situation in America today where there are 49 states, obviously, who have and allow a concealed carry permit. There are 40 states that allow varying degrees of reciprocity. What this bill allows is a national or federal standard to apply to all those states. Now, to repeat what I've just said and then to uh, get more to the subject at hand, if a state says, for example, to its own residents that you cannot, if you have a concealed carry permit, go into a public place, it might be a school, it might be a public building or whatever, uh, you are still not allowed to go into those buildings if you're coming from out of state. But there are going to be instances where there is some slight difference between the states and how, what their standards are to give or issue a concealed carry. And what we have said, if a state has a concealed carry, that you're going to be able to go into that state regardless there. Again, the idea is to have some consistency, have a national standard, and still respect states' rights and also uh, local jurisdictions' rights who might decide you can't take a firearm, for example, uh, onto school premises. Well, let, let's, let's be clear. If you are not entitled to get a weapon because of convictions, uh, the state has decided that people with certain convictions can't get a concealed weapons permit. You can go to another state, get a concealed weapons permit, and that concealed weapons permit would have to be accepted anywhere, even though if, if you're in Virginia, you can go to Utah, get a concealed weapons permit, and that can go all over North Carolina, and yeah. couldn't have got with a concealed weapons permit, carrying yeah. a concealed weapons, where I was not able to get a concealed weapons permit in Virginia, and North Carolina wouldn't allow me to get a concealed weapons permit because of certain convictions okay. or other kinds of um, problems. 
that um, you're going to have one state that's going to be the concealed weapons permit state. Uh, there's no, uh, you, we, we're not sure whether you even have to show up in person. You can just order this thing over the internet. You pay enough fee, get your concealed weapons permit. You're good everywhere but your home state. Let me address what the gentleman from Virginia just said. When it comes to convictions, anyone who has been convicted of a felony is not eligible to get a concealed carry permit. And nor are they eligible to get a concealed carry permit if they've been convicted of certain misdemeanors like domestic violence. But there are going to be some states, New York being an example, uh, where, say, sex crimes might be considered by that state to be a misdemeanor, not a felony, as they are in many, many other states. That is not a problem with the concealed carry bill. That's a problem with those states that those states decide that those crimes are sufficiently severe and should be felonies or as they are in many other states, and then that individual would not be eligible to get a concealed carry. But that's not a problem with the bill. It's a problem with the states that aren't, in my judgment, uh, taking these crimes seriously enough. Well, Mr. Chairman, some states also require you to have some minimum degree of training so that if you're carrying a concealed weapons permit, you know what you're carrying. Uh, but the, these little variations, I mean, the, the state ought to, have, ought to decide that if you have certain convictions, you shouldn't be able to carry a concealed weapon. If you're going to con carry a concealed weapon, you ought to have certain, um, a certain training. And, that, and, and so you have people coming into your state untrained with convictions that would prohibit them from getting a concealed weapons permit in that state. Um, that's why the um, International Association of Chiefs of Police, the major <coughs> cities chiefs association, the police foundation, uh, National Latino Peace Officers Association, National Organization of Black Law Enforcement Executives, all oppose the legislation. Thank you. Ms. Slaughter. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, in response to what you just said, Mr. Scott, when uh, Dr. Teller was killed in church, uh, we uh, did some study uh, with CRS in our office to see what most of us had grown up always believing was a sanctuary, a religious building. Uh, it is no longer that, and the, the number of people who were killed during church services or in any kind of religious service were really quite appalling to us. Uh, the number of law enforcement, uh, people killed in the line of duty, has increased exponentially. Um, I'm not happy to see this bill here. For, it continues this fact that we're absolutely not going to do anything in this house about creating jobs anywhere. Uh, but... New York, let me just speak about my own state here for a minute. Uh, New York bars persons convicted of sex crimes from carrying and possessing the gun, but this bill will override that? I'm sorry? New York prohibits people convicted of sex crimes from carrying weapons. Does this bill over override? It will depend on the level of the sex crime. Uh, if there are felonies, the law uh, would not allow those individuals to get concealed uh -huh. carry. Well, well, if you can get the concealed weapons permit in your home state, you could bring it into New York, and, exactly. and the concealed weapons permit is good, notwithstanding the fact that New York had a different idea. Do I understand from what you said, if you live in New York and you go to Utah, if we use that for the example that you brought up, and get a concealed weapon permit, you, you can go back to New York? You can't, you can't come back to your home state, okay. but you can go to any other state, any other with, state that, with that concealed weapons permit. Uh, one of the things, too, is that uh, New York denies uh, firearm permits to persons with domestic violence incidents. Uh, Fourteen states require good moral character. That, that's all overridden here as well, is it not? Uh, this would allow a domestic violence abuser to cross state lines and kill somebody. Um, no, in the case, of, if I may respond, I, if there is a domestic violence misdemeanor, it is prohibited. Uh, they are prohibited from getting a concealed carry, as well as with a number of felonies. But I want to go back to the point made just a minute ago. I don't consider um, it the fault of the legislation that states have decided that some crimes are not serious enough to be considered felonies. If you, if state that you are from decides that some sex crime only can be determined to be a misdemeanor, uh, I don't think so. Uh, and in many cases, that's the case in New York, but I, and I can't explain why or how, but if they don't want someone to come into that state, all they have to do is say that those crimes are of a more serious nature of felony. Well, the New York Times this morning had a lengthy article going several pages of numbers of felons throughout the country, many of them with mental problems and serious other things, and how easy it was yeah. uh, for them to regain their gun permits. And I really want to recommend everybody that you look at that but I think 
What bothers me most, and, I, and Frank, I'd like to ask unanimous consent to put that in the record. Without objection, will be included in the record. Thank you. Uh, our colleague was grievously wounded here about 10 months ago, shot in the head. Uh, and by all accounts, a man who was a superb federal justice was shot to death there. A little nine-year-old girl who only wanted to go see her congresswoman was killed. Federal employees were killed. Were these individuals killed by those with, who were... With, uh, with Gabby Gifford. With, I'm sorry? Gabrielle Gifford. Right. But you they know, were, she's they, been they shot. Were not they were not injured or killed uh, or maimed by... I'm assuming by, he... The, 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 by an individual with a concealed carry permit, I don't but believe. I, I'm assuming that he did not walk out there and with those guns blazing out of the store. Well, those are interesting they statistics, but they're relevant to this bill. Well, dead is dead, Mr. Smith. And I'll, I'll tell that, you... That has nothing to do with I, concealed well, let me carry. Well, explain this to you. If, when you want everybody to have a gun... No, I don't oh, want well, everybody... Just no, no, you. that's, that's, not a, that's an this. inaccurate statement for why, me to say that. Why, do why, not please? put words in my mouth. All I do right. not want everybody to have a gun. That should be clear from my opening statement. But everybody has one. They're not... They're not dead. Not everybody they has a gun either. somebody. Right. Not everybody has a gun. What not everybody should have a gun. What is to me is the, the, the Second Amendment right. We're talking that about a concealed carry over. permit here. We're not talking about other I will, crimes, I want to make this clear because it's important weapons. for me. I want to say this. The rights given to, but frankly, I've never agreed with that. I believe that the well-regulated militia, which was headed up by General Daniel Morgan in the Revolutionary War and consisted of people who fought from the prairies and brought their both uh, guns and shot and then went back home with them. I believe that's what the Second Amendment is. But in any case, what amendment protects that little girl and that judge and Gabby Gifford and her staff? What are they supposed to do? That, that is if, a, his, if the rights of the gun toter that is a are more important than their right to go to the grocery we, store we can discuss and to the go second back home, amendment to the Constitution are we supposed to learn to dodge bullets? Or are we all supposed to but, wear bulletproof garb? But, what do we do? What but, do the rest but, of us with do? With all respect, we're here talking about a concealed it's all part permit. of the same path. If you're in favor of Americans gun control, that's each a other different issue. Right with guns you're entitled to your opinion, is all I can tell you. Well, I, 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 I think it's all the same piece, the same package, and I'm sure that uh, I, I'm with law enforcement on this. Yeah. Uh, I, I certainly yeah. understand, but I don't Ms. know Potter, why. You might want to prohibit all guns. I, I don't know if you want to prohibit all guns or not, because that's sort of the natural result of the kind of policy you're describing. I don't agree with that, but that's not why we're here. If you want to permit all guns, that's your opinion. You're no, entitled to it. No, I sure don't. I want to, frankly, um, I, I don't think it does us any good to have so many citizens killed. Well, I don't like people being killed. If you, if you want to prohibit all guns, that's up to you, but that's if they can't even that's go subject to of gun control with any goes beyond this bill right here. And I think anybody who would ever allow anybody can conceal weapons into a bar in the first place, I don't know what in the world that is. They don't to. have to. If a jurisdiction prohibits that, if a state prohibits that, if a city prohibits that, an uh, individual with concealed carry permit cannot go into that bar, cannot go into that public building. When, when well, if, I when still if, would like to know when, if we when, couldn't get us, ourselves an amendment to the Constitution that would protect those of us who really go about our daily business with some possibility that we could get home from work or that we could go see our congressperson without fear of being shot to death. Uh, I, I, maybe we ought to really start to work on something like that see what we can do. Obviously, I think if, the people if, who get these gun permits, Ms. Uh, Potter, many if, of them who commit if, heinous crimes. If you want to reduce crime in America, if you want to reduce violent crime, then you would support a wider use of concealed <coughs> carry because demonstrably it has reduced crime. I don't see that, and I don't see that I'll, in any, I'll give any you other 18, country. I'll give you 18, so awful with this wild 18 studies have shown that it reduces crime. There's not a single study that says it's increased crime. Increased crime. Well, I, I sure am not going to take that on any kind of faith. Okay. Because <laughs> <laughs> that certainly doesn't coincide with anything I've seen anywhere. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I <clears throat> want to thank Chairman Smith for his work on this bill and for bringing it um, to the House for its vote. Five minutes. Okay. We all took an oath to uphold the Constitution, and in my opinion, the right to carry is an integral part of our upholding the Constitution. And frankly, I, I don't think the founders intended for um, concealed carry to have been carved out as it has been um, in the past. And so I'm very happy to see this bill come forward. I think 
if there were a definition, a true definition of the term straw dog in the dictionary, it's this last soliloquy that we just heard, uh, which brought up all kinds of arguments against this legislation, which, as the chairman has said, has absolutely nothing to do with this piece of legislation. Um, I agree with the chairman that um, more widespread use of weapons by the law-abiding public would do a great deal to bring down the cause, the, the crime rates in this country. And uh, I appreciate very much um, your bringing this bill to us, and I look forward to its passage by a wide margin in a bipartisan fashion. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, just, just a couple of things. First of all, on the, on the issue of state right and the issue of states' rights, that's um, – I, I mean, my understanding is that if you get a permit to carry a concealed weapon in one state, that would allow you to carry a concealed weapon in another state that may have had a higher standard of what would be required for you to get that license to begin with, that, that permit to begin with. Am I correct? Um, let me. Some, some states require, you know, you know, more That's training correct. and stuff. So, but, 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 there, there, but that is a, that is a state's rights issue uh, about who gets the permits to begin with. And so, when you say that you know, this doesn't do anything to erode states' rights, it does. It says to some states to say we want a higher standard uh, in place before we give somebody a permit. That gets overridden by somebody who gets a permit in a state that has no, very little standards. Um, you know, uh, we've got, uh, you know. Uh, uh, Mr. Slaughter talked about domestic violence. There were 38 states uh, that prohibit individuals con convicted of certain offenses, such as stalking, domestic violence, and impersonating a police officer from owning a gun. But this this bill would override all that. And so, I mean, this is a state's rights matter. I mean, I, I, I'm confused because we have all these debates up here about how we want to get uh, the federal government off people's backs and let the states decide what they want to do. But here we're making a very specific kind of car road saying, except when it comes to this. And um, I'm just curious. Well, um, what I think holds, uh, comes up with the common standard here is these states at least have recognized the right for a concealed carry permit. There, there may be different gradations between states. You're absolutely right. But that's right. important, though. I mean, right, well, who gets the permit? I mean, yeah. what it takes to get a they, permit to begin they, with? They've recognized the right, and that right is right. something – but if, in, in a state that would require somebody to, you know, get certain yeah. amounts of training and, you know, what, before they get it, right. right, they may not necessarily reckon yeah. the person who and, gets and, it in and, one state may not necessarily yeah. get it in another state. But yeah. once he gets it, he can bring it all over the place. Well, uh, to some extent, that is true. You can go into a state that doesn't have the exact requirements of another right. state. But that's but, a big deal. But, uh, well, it, I hope it's a big deal to you and others to apply states' rights in other areas as well as no, this. No, I mean, too, I'm but, just, I mean, I'm, um, but that is a big deal about, you know, what it takes to get a permit. Yeah. Um, but the idea, the idea here is reciprocity. And let me give you another example. Different states have different requirements for driver's licenses, and yet other states recognize other states' driver's licenses, even though there may be different distinctions as to what it takes to get a driver's license. That idea of reciprocity exists in any number of licenses, I, I, I including a concealed I, I, carry I, I license. I've got to tell you, the, will the, will the gentleman yield for a moment? To the gentleman. Yeah, I, I, I just wonder if that well-articulated case for reciprocity also applies to marriage definitions between the, the states. I suspect it does apply to marriage licenses as well. Okay, including some states that allow same-sex marriage licenses that would then be good in, in other states as well through reciprocity? Not, not always. Not always. Well, I, a consistent, I mean, I, I think that, again... I, I think I like my example better of the, li of the driver's licenses. The well, again, when all matters of, of civil licensing, whether it's uh, permission to drive, uh, marriage, concealed weapon, um, you know, I, I think that there's an approach that you indicated with regard to reciprocity that I think there's a lot, uh, lot would make a lot. Between a, I think there's a lot more in common between a concealed carry and a, and, a, uh, and a driver's license than there is between licenses that deal with social behavior, to tell you the truth. Uh, I, would you care to further elaborate? I mean, they're both, you know, both these are, these are again, it's a legal recognition of a particular uh, item that's a civil function, and it's generally, it's, it's more of a state sovereignty issue. Uh, on those, uh, and again, for for the convenience of our populace as a country, 
uh, the argument would be why not have the, the reciprocity with regard to marriage as well. I, I have a hunch you're going to be making that argument, are you not? <laughs> <laughs> I'll yield back to John from Massachusetts. No, I thank you. And, I, and again, I, 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 I think there's a difference between a driver's license and the ability to carry a concealed weapon into, into my state. I, I, do you have any comment why, why all these police chief, chief organizations and well, police, uh, police associations are against this bill? Yeah, I'd have to look. Some of the associations that I heard about are not what you might call mainstream law enforcement associations. I'd have to know more about the list and take a look at them. With the gentleman, yeah, I mean, you, uh, the International Association of Chiefs of Police and Major Cities <laughs> Chiefs Association, which is comprised of police chiefs of 56 major U.S. cities, and I, 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 I've got to say that I think uh, if we're talking about They're public not a fringe organization, I, I think if you're talking about public safety, absolutely, who carries a concealed weapon within your jurisdiction is more of a question of public safety than who's married and who isn't married. Um, I mean, that's not a question of public safety. And, um, and so when, when, you, and you, when you're talking about um, uh, states' rights, one of the reasons the police officers um, have a problem with this is if you find somebody with a concealed weapon and they pull some paper out of their pocket that purports to be an out-of-state uh, concealed weapons permit, they don't know what they're looking at. I mean, you get some sheriff in a, in a county in Massachusetts and he's presented with some document document that says it's from New Mexico. Is it valid? No. Most of the states most of the states don't have 24-hour verification, so you can't even call anybody. Now, one of the reasons that um, uh, Virginia doesn't have reciprocity with several states is that they do not have 24-hour verification. So you can call some phone number and ascertain whether this guy has a concealed weapons permit or not. And because they don't have the 24-hour verification, Virginia does not have reciprocity with them because they want that ability to verify. That's why the chiefs uh, uh, have a problem with this legislation. Um, um, with the, with the gentleman, the gentleman. Yeah, with the gentleman, you. just for a minute. Uh, let me respond because if all someone had to do was show a concealed carry permit uh, alone, that might uh, raise some questions. But in point of fact, you don't just have to show that. You have to show a government ID document as well. And furthermore, there's been a development there. You can check to make sure there is an inlet system that allows uh, law enforcement agencies and other state agencies to check the validity of out-of-state concealed permits. Um, if Even if you're in a state that doesn't have the inlet system, you can still access that from out of state. So there is a way to make sure that the person who has the permit yeah, but not, is who not they is hour who basis. They, it's and I, and I, I've just been told it is now available 24 hours. I hope that that's accurate. Okay, well, that's not what we were told during the hearing. I have, I, you, you have any more to add, Mr. Smith, Mr. Scott? Uh, no, except that um, uh, one, the verification, and you've mentioned the state's rights. Right. This, is, this is a big deal, whether or not um, uh, people with certain backgrounds ought to be carrying concealed weapons. That's a, the that's a question the state makes, and the purpose of this bill, bill is to override that with the lowest common denominator. And I, I just have one, one final comment. We just came back from a recess. Um, you know, we all spent a week in our districts, and uh, I'm sure you spent a week in your district. i got to be honest with you. I, I didn't run into a single person who talked about this issue. I mean, I ran into people who don't have jobs. I ran into people who are concerned about whether they're going to be able to afford to send their kids to college. I ran into people who are, are losing their homes. I ran into people who are struggling small business, businessmen and women trying to earn, you make a living, you know, saying, what are you doing here in Congress? And we're doing this. And i gotta t I got to be honest with you. In the scheme of things and with, with the economic crisis that we're dealing with, and I respect the work that gets done on the Judiciary Committee, but I mean, we should be we should be jobs every single day of the week, and I I find it very difficult to look at this as a as a jobs bill, uh, to be honest with you. So I don't I don't you know I don't know what we're thinking here, but uh, this is this is not what I heard back home. I, I I'm willing to bet this is not what you heard back home uh, either. Actually, I was going to point out there might be a difference between Massachusetts and Texas because <laughs> uh, when I brought this up at town meetings, they were very interested in it. Yeah. Well, I bet you some of those people in Texas would also be interested in jobs too. Yep. Uh, because we have an economic crisis that we're trying to dig ourselves out of, yep. and they're looking for so, some help from here in Congress. And quite yeah. frankly, you know, with respect, this is not an answer to our economic problems in this country, and we should be yeah. dealing with jobs bills instead of this. He said that with respect. I yield back my time, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Bishop. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, 
Chairman, and um, it is really heartening for me to see this, uh, this, this fealty towards federalism that my friends on the Democrat side have finally found. I assume because of this thing that is so unique, that's why we have the extra lights here, because the light has found this room. And we will now be dealing with, on, with state rights issues on a whole bunch of other issues that have been ignored in the past. So I, I'm proud. I'm proud of that concept of federalism. Let's hope that you hold on to that constitutional concept for the remainder of this session as strongly as you have here tonight. Because I know, deep down inside, you understand why the Founding Fathers wrote that concept uh, without sitting specifically into the document itself. Uh, Mr. Smith, could I ask a question? Um, I don't know if, if the phrase, the Lautenberg Amendment, is something of which you are familiar. Yes, to some extent. Does, how does this bill impact the Lautenberg Amendment, which was passed, I'm not quite sure, in the uh, 80s and the 90s? My, well, which would I deny. I think of the Lautenberg Amendment, at least as it's being discussed recently, it has to do with refugees coming uh, from the Soviet Union, so I don't think that would be related. You must this, be thinking of this one. Idea. This one dealt, uh, like I say, well before I came here, yeah. um, with the, uh, the ability of someone to have a concealed weapon permit if they were convicted or have been accused of a domestic violence event, even if they happen to be uh, a member of, of the law enforcement community. I realized that at the time the law enforcement community was violently opposed to that, but Congress seemed to pass that amendment anyway. Does this bill have some kind of impact on that, or would it leave it the same way it is? I understand it does not have any impact on that. So that effort of the federal government to dictate to states what would be and would not be their gun policy, which certainly would not fit with federalism, but was, but was accepted by a lot of people who are still here on the other side, uh, that has no impact then? That's correct. Does this have any impact on open carry laws? Not to my knowledge. So those still stay the same. Yeah. If this were not the case, and if I were from the Wild West, as people have assumed, and I did have a concealed weapon permit, yes. and I wanted to drive back here to this bastion of civilization we call Washington, D.C., uh, what would I have to do with that permit as I drove from state to state to state if this bill were not in uh, effect? Under current law, you would not be able to take that firearm from state to state. So I would have to wait and to the first state I got, check what their laws were, and either put it in the trunk or continue to carry. Correct. Then I could take it back out the next state I got to. Correct. And under current law, of course, because D.C. has chosen affirmatively not to allow concealed carry, you ultimately would not be able to drive into the District of Columbia uh, under those conditions. Since it would be very difficult for the average gun owner who has a concealed weapon permit to know the intricacies of every state, would it not be a significant disadvantage for them to have to do that? Or at least it would be a significant, let's put it in the positive way, it would be a significant advantage for them to realize that that would not have to be a practice of stopping, yes. hiding it, stopping, unloading it, stopping, hiding it one more time. That's good. Gentlemen, yield. I would be happy. I I obviously, to the chairman, I will always I yield. My friend for yielding. I'm not a fool. And so that would also be the case as far as this Columbia is concerned under the legislation itself. That's correct. Right. Good point. Yeah. Thank you. I thank well, you. Well, could, could I, could I if, you'd also have, as you go from state to state, as the uh, chairman has indicated, you still have to obey the laws of that state, either if, if, once you've got the permit, whether which is, you, whether, which whether is you, one of those wonderful things that most whether you can go into a bar, whether, whether do some, that anyway. some 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 prohibit going into a bar with a concealed weapon, some schools, some colleges. I mean, but you'd have to abide by the state laws, so you would have to know all those state little state laws as you go from state to state, anyway, whether this bill passes or not. It's probably a good point. I guess the first the first step is at least a first step in the right direction. Mr. Smith, if I could ask a couple of others, was John Lott, from, who at least used to be from the University of Chicago, was he part of the testifying process for this? Were any of his studies added to the uh, record? His, was he his studies were certainly cited, mentioned, and put in the record. He himself did not testify. So when you said that the studies have indicated that those states that have a more rational approach to allow people to have concealed weapon permits, the more rational approach to be able to defend themselves with guns, have a better record as far as the overall crime rate concerns uh, that's based on academic work. Uh, that is correct. If I may go into a little bit more detail there. Uh, based on data from the FBI's annual uniform crime report, 
uh, that right to carry states, those that widely allow concealed carry, have 22 percent lower total violent crime rates, 30 percent lower murder rates, 46 percent lower robbery rates, 12 percent lower aggravated assault rates as compared to the rest of the country. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, even though that looks like it was a setup question, <laughs> Um, I did not know if you had dealt with John Lott. I do know John Lott. I have yeah. worked with him in the past. I have read his studies in the past, which is why I want – it was a legitimate question of inquiry as to if you would actually use He's conducted studies. several studies, all with the well, same, was we same have, results. We have <laughs> – we uh, we've talked also here in some detail about comparing a driver's license, which you do have the ability of going with a uh, concealed yeah. weapon permit license. Is there not at least some distinction between those two, i.e., is not a driver's license a privilege not covered by any part of the Constitution as a constitutional right, vis-a-vis -a, -vis a concealed weapon permit, which does deal with a Second Amendment right in the Constitution, which is certainly not a privilege, but indeed a constitutional right? right? Uh, between the two, I think I know where you're headed. The uh, Second Amendment right... Uh, to carry and use a firearm certainly would be even stronger than, say, a driver's license, which is not necessarily constitutionally protected. That's correct. In, in trying to balance this equation between states' rights as well as the constitutional right of the Second Amendment, right. um, it is a balancing act. And I feel somewhat frustrated that people all of a sudden want to use states' rights now when they have not used them in other situations. I also feel it a significant act that saying a constitutional right should take precedence in some way, shape, or form over a principle, a privilege, i.e. a driver's license, other kinds of licenses that happen to be there. Right. It is frustrating to me that Congress in years past has violated both states' rights as well as the constitutional right uh, for the Second Amendment in things like the Lautenberg Amendment, which tried to trumpet and which mm -hmm. was opposed by the law enforcement agencies at the time. So we have a history of doing things improperly in the past, which I hope we can change going forward. I, I, I also found some really unique philosophy that I heard recently in this meeting dealing with the militia that certainly violates what uh, James Madison defined as a militia and the purpose of a militia, mm -hmm. as well as what James Madison wrote when it deals to whether people should have a gun and know how to use it. I've certainly heard some unique concepts here about what we should do to individuals to, to prohibit a pre-described incident which may or may not happen in the future. And I realize we've had some unique concepts here as to the difference between a privilege of somebody in a state versus a constitutional right of somebody Correct. in a state. And since I don't have a concealed weapon permit, I won't have to have the problem of driving and loading and unloading my car within every state boundary I hit. That is correct. And I think the fundamental point that there is a strong constitutional right to bear arms um, is something that should be respected and even um, guarded. Uh, are you back? Mr. Hastings. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, I'd like to... Uh, begin by pointing um, uh, to yet other organizations, as Mr. Scott did, um, uh, that are supportive of uh, this measure not being passed. And just in case uh, Mr. Smith uh, didn't know about those, perhaps he does know about the American Bar Association and the Association of Prosecuting Attorneys. Yeah. Certainly not, the not American... public defenders, but prosecuting attorneys. Yeah. Uh, certainly the American Bar Association in recent years has become a very liberal organization, so their endorsement is not a surprise, or their opposition is not a surprise. I, 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 I find that interesting, having uh, served on several committees in uh, uh, that group and didn't find all those uh, liberals that you're talking about. But I, I, I hear you. Uh, I want to make it very clear and go a little bit to Mr. Polis's point that I imagine that lifting from an article uh, uh, today uh, uh, written by Frank, uh, no, it was in October, written by Frank Bruni, um, that has the title, Have Glock, Will Travel. Imagine how apoplectic they'd be if on certain other matters, Washington forced their states to yield to others' values. The way this bill would compel New York, Massachusetts, 
and Connecticut to honor more permissive gun control regulations from the South and West. As it happens, these three northeastern states all perform all marriage equality, same-sex marriages, which more conservative states do not have to recognize. So I guess I'll be joining Mr. Polis uh, tomorrow in that argument. And let me smack down most immediately on um, uh, the notion uh, that there is newfound attitudes uh, in the Democrats' um, uh, 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 offerings that have to do uh, uh, with states' rights. There are many of us um, that wouldn't be here if all of, of, of the of, uh, states' rights uh, had been observed in the way that uh, they were put forward. Um, the problem that you have here, in my judgment, is that the states have, have put forward um, a considerable amount of time trying to determine just what is best for their citizenry with reference to safety. Last night, I was at an event in uh, Fort Lauderdale, and the sheriff of uh, Broward County, um, one of our colleagues on this uh, our committee is the former sheriff. The sheriff of uh, uh, my county is a Republican and a friend of mine. His name is Al Lamberti. When I pointed out to him that we were getting ready to carry this measure, uh, the exchange that we had in addition to his being astounded that we would be uh, doing this, the exchange that we had is why would anybody want to become a police officer uh, with this kind of confusion uh, that's if this were to be granted uh, by the Senate and uh, the President or uh, signed uh, by them. Uh, where we would go. So I want to ask you, Mr. Smith, you mentioned the inlet system. Which states do not have the inlet system? I will have to check. I think something around 12 to 17 have the inlet system. And as I say, you can now uh, call into the database from outside of those states. So a and, police and officer at 3 a.m. in the morning in one of those states that makes a stop. Oh, Mr. Scott um, pointed to that. What, what, right. what is that person supposed that is, to do? That is actually, I think, just a, uh, a difference of, uh, that is a factual question. It's my understanding that you can call in 24 hours a day. Mr. Scott recalls during our hearing that that was not necessarily the case. We'll have to determine what is. So I gather then you don't think police officers have enough to do uh, uh, stopping people. Now, uh, now I, we're going to allow for this. Let me ask. No, you. I wouldn't. I wouldn't, wouldn't want to uh, to have the record uh, reflect that. That's my view. Uh, right. I do think. I do think protecting the fundamental right to bear arms is worth doing, even if it takes up some time. Okay, then let's go to an airport and talk about taking up some time. Um, I just got off of an airplane with 240 people on it. And I'm sure many members in here did as well. What happens when 40 of them show up at the airport? And I doubt very seriously if on any given day, on any one airplane, um, that that would be the case. And let me tell you how that might work. Let's say that somebody was leaving uh, the gun show that just took place in Marietta, Georgia. And was on their way to the gun show in Ladson, South Carolina, with their guns. And 40 other people are leaving that one and going to go sell guns as well. How does that work at the airport? What do, what do those people uh, all do? You have, the, to, you have to check it in at the counter? No, the bill does nothing affirmatively to allow someone to carry a firearm on an airplane, on an aircraft. Okay, so then I can drive from New York to Utah. I wouldn't have had one because New York's laws are restricted. But I could go from New York and get me a gun and then drive back to New York. And New York, under this law, would have to observe my carrying concealed weapons prerogative. Not if it's your hometown. Not if it's your home. Okay, so... If I don't go to my hometown, 
If I go to Utah. It's good, it's good 49 other states, not your home state. I see. So I go to Utah then, and I get me a gun permit, and I can carry it anywhere I want to except certain states. Well, you see, that's crazy. Uh, And that's why in this particular instance, we're getting ready to get way off the track with something. uh, uh, this, this, uh, This doesn't appear to be particularly relevant, but I have in my hand the gun shows that are established in the United States of America in the month of November alone. And at each of those gun shows, I see the big signs all the time. As a matter of fact, I've been thinking about how to break that up. Um, I I know the first day that we see a sign saying African-American gun show in Harlem uh, in Liberty City in Miami, then there ain't going to be no more gun shows. We will stop giving (laughs) permits uh, at that time. But there is something drastically wrong with weaponizing a society the way that we are doing it. Nobody has any problem getting a gun. Most states already allow uh, for uh, some form of carrying a concealed weapon. But the rub comes when certain states have more strict provisions, and you need then only to read that felons do get guns. And I gather that... They get carrying concealed weapons or permits. New York Times lead article today on the left side of their column dealt specifically with the number of people um, uh, that um, uh, were felons, real felons, not misdemeanors, but people that had committed felons before that got guns and then went somewhere and killed somebody. And it's all right, I gather, if they can pass a less restrictive, like send it in the mail, on um, uh, carrying concealed weapons provision, uh, it's okay uh, for them to have a gun. Well, you and I know it's not okay. Okay? Uh, so I find it passing strange and uh, borrowing uh, from Mr. McGovern's uh, provision and from Mr. Polis. Coming up on 19 years in this institution, it seems to me that my friends, and many of them are my friends, spend a lot of time concerning themselves about guns, um, gay rights, and God. Last week, I had to be reminded about my faith in God. This week, I'm getting ready to let anybody just about carry a concealed weapon just about anywhere. And I guess next week, we'll get around to equality marriage issues, and we won't have done one single solitary thing to cause an American to have a job. I said to a friend once, you're going to have all the guns you need. No gay people are going to be around you. Your children ain't going to go to school with no black people, and you ain't going to have no job. I saw him about two years ago, and he told me that it came true. He doesn't have a job, and he ain't got one uh, because he's a carpenter that wanted guns and didn't want black people to go to school with him and didn't want gay people to have uh, marriage equality. You all can spend your time on this stuff if you want, but there are those of us that are going to continuously rail against it, and I think that it's absurd uh, that we are spending uh, taxpayer time, our time, uh, here in this institution discussing something, number one, that ain't going to become the law, and number two, shouldn't become the law. If we follow this line of reasoning, and uh, Mayor Bloomberg and the mayors against illegal guns at their website, www.ourlivesourlaws.org, um, uh, uh, provide a summary of this legislation where they say that the bill that we are considering <coughs> may very well allow uh, people convicted of assault, domestic abusers, drug addicts, stalkers, people with violent arrest records, people convicted of illegal firearms possession, sex predators, habitual alcohol abusers, people with zero training who've never touched a gun before. Um, if, if we are going to permit them to have um, uh, uh, carrying concealed weapons, it's absurd uh, to uh, the highest degree. State legislatures have intensely debated and ultimately decided their own standards for who can carry a loaded concealed weapon in their communities. 38 states do not issue permits to people who've been convicted of certain felonies 
um, and violent misdemeanors like assault or sex crime. 36 states do not issue permits to people under the age of 21, and 35 states require gun safety training, often including live fire drills or other proof of competency with a firearm. This legislation would eliminate many of those standards, reducing concealed carry permitting uh, to a lowest common denominator imposed by Congress as a federal mandate. I think it will put police officers at risk in every state, and I think it is, I gather we're going to hide under the uh, notion that uh, ignorance of the law is no excuse. That would be the only way we could reach some of these people in light of the fact there's no way in the world that a person that got a gun permit in one state is going to know what the laws are in another state, and I gather they won't be required to. And how crazy is that? Um, knowing local laws and recognizing when someone is breaking them already keeps our law enforcement busy, and we don't have any real national system uh, to check who can legally carry a concealed weapon. I just think it's absolutely absurd. Simply having a concealed carry permit would enable a gun trafficker to bring cars or backpacks full of guns across state lines. And they could simply present their out-of-state carry permit if they got stopped. I think that we have reached uh, the height of absurdity uh, in this institution, and we need to reject this measure, uh, and I hope that we do. I yield back my time. Mr. Woodall. I thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I'd like to say to my friend from from Florida that the issues that you, you raise may be real, but they're issues that we already confront today. Your great state of Florida has reciprocity agreements with 35 other states. If I have a concealed carry permit in Florida, I can carry that permit. It's re uh, carried my handgun. It's recognized in 35 other states. And today, I am required to understand the rules and regulations of those 35 other jurisdictions. I have permission to carry, but I, I have permission to carry only under the rules of that home state. Now, Mr. Chairman, my understanding is that's exactly that's what H.R. 822 would, would do as well. Is that right? That is correct. And also, I am not aware of any state that allows an individual convicted of a felony to get a concealed carry permit. I'd be happy to yield to my friend. Can I hear you say that you're required, if you get that carrying concealed um, uh, weapons permit in Florida, to know the laws in the other state? Required to obey the laws in the other states. Obey state. the laws. That's right. How about knowing them? The ignorance of the law is no excuse, oh, I say to my friend. We got right well, which I absolutely, absolutely agree with. Now, I, Mr. Chairman, I, I struggle with this, too. I, I'm going to raise the state's rights uh, issue, but I'm not going to raise it as a red herring. I'm going to raise it because I'm genuinely, genuinely concerned about it. Uh, I hope, uh, as my friend Mr. Bishop does, that next time we come around to a state's rights issue, we'll have the same... Uh, uh, course of voices uh, supporting uh, individual states. But today in Georgia, we have reciprocity agreements with 24, uh, 24 other states. Um, I'd like for that number to be higher. It generally does hinge on, on mm -hmm. training requirements and, and other issues of that, uh, of that nature. What would you think about an amendment to, to this language that left the 24 agreements that Georgia already has in place in place and then made this federal language the, the floor for those states with whom Georgia does not have reciprocity agreements? Yeah. Um, I would not look favorably on such an idea because it really runs counter to one of the goals of this uh, bill, which is to have a national uh, uniform standard that would allow any state to recognize and offer reciprocity to another state that had a concealed carry permit. I know how strongly you feel. We've obviously talked about this before. And I'm grateful to you for that. Uh, uh, but in the two ways that I've just mentioned, uh, this bill does recognize and respect, respect state laws as well as local jurisdictions. Well, could, the, the, you said 35 states. The state of Florida made that decision. Which 35 states had laws that they wanted to abide by? And 15 states, they did not agree with the two lacks and did not want to have reciprocity with them. That is a decision the state made. Um, one of the things that um, um, I, I think in this whole debate is over the um, uh, research done by Dr. Lott, uh, where the 
basis of the, 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 the core finding is that if more people carried firearms, the crime rate would go down. I would join the gentlelady from uh, New York and say that I, I don't take that research on faith. Uh, in fact, it's been challenged and there are a lot of questions about it. But I mean, if you believe that more people carrying firearms will lower the crime rate, um, then uh, you'd have probably one view of this legislation. And if you believe that, as I do, that more people carrying firearms is not helpful to the crime rate, um, then you probably have a different It is absolutely opinion. true, Mr. Scott, that my view is having the ratio of licensed firearms carriers to unlicensed firearms carriers, having the highest ratio of licensed carriers uh, is what makes me safer. I promise you, as a concealed carry permit uh, holder myself, I feel safer walking the streets of Georgia uh, than I do walking the streets of jurisdictions that do not allow uh, that same uh, privilege. Uh, when you go and stand in line, and I, you may not be a, a concealed carry permit uh, holder, I'd encourage you to go down to the jurisdiction that, uh, that uh, whether it's the probate judge or the county sheriff, and look at the folks who are in line to get those permits. Because what it says to me is uh, there are plenty of guns out there on the streets, as my colleagues on the other side uh, suggested. The question is, are you, are you licensed to carry it? Uh, have, you, have you been looked over? The background track they do on us uh, in Georgia uh, is uh, extensive. Uh, the renewal process is extensive, and the permit is expensive. You, you, you mentioned renewal. The um, uh, you can, the state can revoke a concealed weapons permit, and in fact can revoke reciprocity. If they find another state is issuing um, uh, permits, uh, you can revoke the reciprocity. That's a decision. But this bill will force you to accept the um, validity of an out-of-state license given by a state whose standards you think uh, the home state just thinks are too lax. The, let me ask, Mr. Chairman, I when I got into this bill, I was surprised to learn that there were more states that offered concealed carry permits than there were states that allowed for open carry. When I think of the Second Amendment, I think of open carry as being the most uh, 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 real, um, uh, the, the, the best realization of the, of the Second Amendment. I think of concealed carry as being a little more dangerous uh, for police officers, public safety officers, than, uh, than open carry. What led to this bill uh, coming out of committee uh, with a concealed carry focus instead of an open carry focus? Is there a... I, um, I think, Mr. Woodall, there were a couple of things. One, you have a situation where uh, we know where the country, or we believe we know where the country is going. You've got 49 states now with concealed carry. So clearly that's the most common uh, type of permit allowed, most common uh, way for an individual to uh, possess firearms in ways other than what is usually allowed by law. You've got 40 states already that offer some type or form of reciprocity. So when you're looking at those figures, 40, 49, you might as well have something that really fits everyone and you have a consistent standard. The, uh, I think about my friends in Illinois who do not have the right uh, to carry, and I, I feel uh, for them. But I know you can uh, go over the border to Indiana. You can, if you have a business there, you can get an out-of-state permit in Indiana. Uh, Iowa, uh, their next-door neighbor, and, uh, allows for, for non-resident uh, permits. How does this legislation deal with holders of of non-resident uh, permits. If I'm an Illinois resident holder of a, of a Florida non-resident yeah. uh, permit, can, is that Florida non-resident permit then recognized in the other 49 jurisdictions, just not my home jurisdiction? Hmm. In the case of Illinois, as I mentioned, Illinois has permanently chosen not to issue concealed carry, so you cannot go into that state. Uh, states that have taken no position, this may or may not be answering your question, are allowed to have individuals enter those states with a concealed carry unless they've affirmatively uh, denied it because of the constitutional right uh, to bear arms. Um, the bill treats out-of-state permits the same as one from your own state. Okay. Fantastic. Well, except that you can't use the out-of-state permit in your home state. You can use it in all of the other states, just not your home state. So you can't. I think that's correct. You can't go, you can't um, uh, get an in-state permit by going out of state. But if you do go out of state, you can use that permit anywhere else. And, and some, we had testimony, it's not clear that you actually have to be physically present to get a permit. You might be able to buy these things over the Internet. Mm -hmm. And the way this thing is going, um, you know, this is going to be a revenue enhancement uh, where you just charge enough money and people just over the Internet get a little concealed weapons permit that they were not entitled to get in the home state. Yeah. The, having been through that licensing process, I, I do trust those state jurisdictions to, uh, to do a quality job as they are doing 
today, and I'd say to the chairman, uh, this has been a bill that's been knocking around these chambers for a long, long time, and it's always been widely co-sponsored, always been widely, widely supported, uh, but just does not uh, make it to the floor. And I just want to tell you how much I appreciate it. I agree with Speaker Boehner. The House works best when the House works its will, and here you've taken a bill that has wide uh, uh, support, bipartisan uh, support, and you've brought it to the floor so the House can work its will tomorrow. Chairman I'm grateful to you Thank for it. I'd be happy to yield to my friend. Uh, I would, uh, I'm interested, the gentleman had indicated, I don't know whether it's true or not, that you can just go on the Internet and get a conceal and carry license. Is that true? The, in the state of Georgia, and we're a must-issue uh, state, so I would argue that we're as uh, as uh, as liberal as you're likely to find, uh, that is absolutely not true. You must show up at the probate judge. Uh, you must be fingerprinted. Uh, you must pay for your background uh, check. Uh, you must uh, uh, go on, as, as in, in many states, provide uh, certification of, of some level of training, uh, as the gentleman indicated in Virginia, uh, as one of the requirements. So it's a, it's a very thorough process, and it doesn't happen instantly. Even in a must-issue state like Georgia, uh, it takes uh, weeks, if not months, uh, for that process to finish because, again, you can have two choices. You can have unlicensed gun owners or you can have licensed gun carriers. Uh, and I prefer every day uh, that uh, I'm standing beside someone who's been certified. Gentleman Yield. Be happy to yield. Uh, but but uh, continuing this conversation, I appreciate it. But in a must-issue state, is that the term you use? That's right. Does that mean you must issue it to them no matter what their background is? The, you raise an interesting uh, question, and, and that's right. Most is, must issue is the most permissive issuing category. And the answer to your question is absolutely not. Must issue means... Then why would someone come before this committee and, 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 and offer testimony that you could get it on the Internet? Why would someone... Because that's, that? because that's in, 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 in Georgia. They, that's the requirement of Georgia. The testimony that we heard in the committee was it's no, there's nothing in the bill that requires a physical presence to get the uh, permit. I, Whatever I appreciate the gentleman, but the gentleman is from Georgia. Georgia, and you said it is a requirement that Internet... Uh, in Georgia. In Georgia. We, we you are, said that is not correct. In, in a must-issue state like Georgia, must-issue means if someone applies and they qualify, oh. a permit must be issued, and that qualification process is extensive. But it's not over the Internet in for Georgia. a decision to it, be made. It is, it is in person, again, with fingerprint cards through the, through the judge's office, the probate judge. And, uh, so if someone suggested that you could gain that in Georgia in testimony before this committee, you would tell them that's not correct. Well, I, I will say to my friend, and, and he has been here uh, a year or two longer than, than I have. But with it, respect. It, with respect. Uh, it is one of my great frustrations 11 months in that these are serious issues. Licensing of handguns is a serious issue. Concealed carry is a serious issue. And states' rights under the Ninth and Tenth Amendment are serious issues. Uh, and yes, uh, when you walk into a hearing like this and you see the red herrings thrown out one after the other after the other, it cheapens the entire debate. The Second Amendment is important, the Ninth Amendment is important, and the Tenth Amendment is important. Well, if the gentleman and it is a great frustration to me um, that when dealing with issues of that gravity, I thank the that gentleman we don't, for engaging uh, with me and for the time that he extended, ma'am. Well, if the gentleman would point where in the bill you're required to have a physical presence in, if you get that not in not in Georgia but in Utah or Montana, or a prohibition against them changing the laws to allow it over the internet, then uh, maybe we should have that amendment to prohibit uh, internet. Um, uh, obtaining uh, these permits over the Internet and, ha and require a physical presence in front of a judicial officer. Maybe, maybe we should have that, but it's not in the bill. Uh, I'm, uh, if the gentleman will yield, I'm not aware of a single state where you don't have to physically go get your fingerprints. Well, uh, the, um, the testimony in the committee was um, uh, not clear as to whether or not uh, okay. in... Well, let me clarify the record. I think every state requires physical presence for fingerprints. And, finger, for and, 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 and this bill, if they change, if they change we're it, not, it's not required we're not, physical presence? We're not change, changing that or... It's an, it's an well, existence no, in all well, well, that, That's exactly what we're doing, because if they change it to not require a physical presence, that Internet concealed weapons permit is, is good is, all is over the Is the gentleman suggesting a, a federal licensing uh, uh, procedure that we adopt the Georgia just, standards on a federal level so that we can all uh, carry? That would certainly oh, that, solve the issue that the gentleman's concerned that, about. That would be better than this bill. Well, I, I, I look forward to working with the gentleman to make and that. And offer the uh, amendment. And I yield back the balance. <laughs> uh, Thank you. Um, I'd like to submit this to the record, and I'll, if you could 
I'll hand the gentleman to you. This is a map courtesy of the Rocky Mountain Gun Earners Association. Um, he just passed that down there to them as well. Uh, it shows Colorado's reciprocal uh, agreements. I think we have about 30. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, so, I, I mean, I guess what, you know, what we had to approach this is it seems like a solution in search of a problem. Uh, for a Colorado gun owner, very easy to get a concealed permit. We have a must issue as well. Uh, you can drive to any one of our neighboring states. It's still good. Now, I see here it's not good in Nevada. And the question, why is that not a matter between the sovereign uh, state of Colorado and the sovereign state of Nevada approach to their state legislators and governors to work out? Why does this require uh, federal intervention and bureaucrats in Washington deciding this rather than in our states? Hmm. Well, as I mentioned a while ago, I think there is value in having a consistent standard that uh, is not confusing where you don't have 50 different types of uh, variations of a, of a um, respecting the fundamental right to bear arms. Uh, the fact that different states might have different uh, standards to acquire a concealed carry uh, is not as important in my judgment as the fact that we need to allow reciprocity and allow states to recognize the rights of uh, those in other states to cross state lines with a concealed carry permit. And as I mentioned again, uh, and it's just a difference of opinion, uh, this bill does respect uh, states' rights in two fundamental ways. If a state like Illinois is, has affirmatively said you cannot have a concealed carry, you're not allowed to go into that state with a concealed carry from another state. And second of all, if either local jurisdictions or the states themselves um, have decided that one should not, uh, under a concealed carry permit, uh, carry a firearm into a public facility or a church or a bar or a sports event, uh, those instances will be recognized under this bill. Do you, do you believe that, uh, I think Illinois has been brought up a number of times, do you believe that, uh, and I believe it was in, the, in, in reference to them not having a concealed carry regime, is that, is that the, you said Illinois does not allow concealed carry? Uh, Illinois, and uh, I mean, do you believe it's a constitutional right of a state if they choose uh, to not have a way to have concealed carry, or do you believe that under the Second Amendment a state is required to have uh, a, a, ver a version of concealed carry laws? Um, I did not okay. hear what let me, I was let me ask. told, so let me ask you to repeat the question. Sure, okay. So uh, Illinois has been brought up a number of times, and uh, based on this, it's my understanding Illinois does not have a uh, concealed permit uh, system. So my question is, do you feel that not having a concealed permit system is contrary to the Second Amendment and states actually have to have a, a way to have a concealed permit in their state? No, in that case, I think that's up to the state to decide that uh, I don't think the Second Amendment requires states to all have concealed carry permits. I, th okay. I think it is a protected right, not a required right. And also, uh, just to be clear, you, I, I don't think you're arguing this particular proposal, which has its merits and its flaws that have been pointed out, uh, kind of weighing the Second Amendment versus the Ninth and Tenth Amendments. Uh, do you believe that this this is constitutionally required to protect the Second Amendment, or is it optional and just good policy that you're advancing? The problem here is that, quite frankly, states don't have constitutional rights. Individuals do. And so I do think an individual has a constitutional right to, for example, if we deem it, uh, to carry a weapon or a firearm into another state that recognizes concealed carry permit. Sure. And I, again, I, I have uh, this particular group, Rocky Mountain Gun Owners, has been calling my office against this particular bill. They're worried about the federal overreach. Uh, they're worried that this is the foot in the door for uh, a lot of what could, could come with federal bureaucrats making decisions and having a federal database about about who has it and who doesn't. I think this would be a, a larger issue for me and my constituents, many of whom have concealed weapons permits, uh, if uh, we didn't have these reciprocity agreements. I mean, I think that generally my constituents are quite content with them, and to the extent they're not, um, you know, I would direct their attention to our governor and our state legislature, both of whom I think are very receptive to negotiating more. Um, but, you know, given that uh, many of the calls from the gun owners groups in my states have been uh, against this, uh, you know, I, I, I'm far from convinced that it's, it's needed, um, given the many reciprocity agreements uh, that exist. And if the people of Illinois you know, need one or want one, they need to elect a governor, it would seem, that would, would, would do that rather than come crying to, to Washington. Well, the gentleman, yes. just, just, just very brief, you're talking about, he keeps talking about consistent standards. He's not consistent standards. He's the lowest common denominator standards. If you wanted a consistent standard, then you could have some standards. Maybe everybody adopt, we will agree that Georgia's standards would be the standard. But this says whoever's got the lowest standard, dealing them out without any kind of requirement, no training, no nothing, you got to honor that permit too. So it's not consistent standard, it's lowest standard. 
Uh, let me ask a, just a, this is just a, I guess a legal question. At the bottom of this map from this gun advocacy group, it says, please be aware you must abide by the laws of the state you are traveling. Many differ from those of Colorado. Under this proposed federal law, would you also have to, you'd have to abide by the laws of the state you were in as well. Is that, is that correct? That's right. Okay. Um, so this is a, a, it encroaches the, the state sovereignty somewhat, but it does require that they also uh, fill that. Again, but, uh, not an but, issue that my you constituents can, you have been, You cannot yeah. be eligible to get a permit in that state. You might not be old enough. You might not have the Okay. Permit. So even though you might, you might not have to follow, in effect, you might not be eligible Right. In, in a state because of an age or prior conviction, perhaps a misdemeanor, uh, because of uh, some psychological uh, um, training. Yeah, interesting. You might not have been able to get a permit, but if you have the permit, you have to abide by the rules in terms of whether you can carry sure. it into a bar or school. Or that kind yeah, of so, you know, again, and I represent a district with, and a state with many, many concealed uh, gun um, permit holders. I don't happen to be one myself. Many of my friends are. Um, but this is just simply, you know, not not a uh, it's sort of a solution in search of a problem. I've, I've not been hearing this from them, and uh, maybe this can provide a renewed focus for all of us on encouraging states that want to do this to enter more reciprocity agreements rather than take this power to Washington. Um, and I yield back the balance of my time to the chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. A uh, lot of discussion, particularly about Illinois, and I have a little experience there because I was born and raised and was a police officer in Illinois for 12 years. And one of the things that always struck me was that we had to have a gun owner's ID card. Is that still in effect in Illinois? I don't know, but I can find out. It just, it always struck me as a police officer that legal folks had to have a gun owner's ID card, but those that were committing the vast majority of the crimes, and it's anecdotal evidence, obviously, that I dealt with never had a gun owner's ID card. Uh, and what I've seen in my years of experience in Florida mm -hmm. is that those that did have a concealed weapons permit, I don't recall uh, an occasion of arresting them for committing a homicide or an armed robbery. Uh, you know, the bad guys could care less about legal folks in the ability to get a concealed weapons permit. They're going to carry a gun because they can. Uh, Mr. Nugent, I don't know about Illinois or those states. I do know that uh, we can look at Florida as a case uh, example, for example. Uh, in the case of Florida, I think it's 0.03 percent of concealed carry permit holders uh, have had to give up those licenses. I mean, that's what, three out of a thousand or something like that. Uh, by far, the great majority of concealed carry permit holders are law-abiding. Uh, they may actually prevent crimes from occurring, and certainly they can feel better about defending themselves uh, in their own home. Well, well I've actually seen that uh, in regards to preventing crime, uh, where a concealed weapon holder uh, was coming by and, and assisted a deputy. Across the United States, I believe it's between 2 million and 2.5 million Incidents occur every year where an individual uses a firearm to prevent a crime from occurring. Well, you know, one of the things and when you talk about consistency and what you, what you don't want to do is make someone who is a law-abiding legal firearms in regards to having a concealed weapon permit mm -hmm. a criminal because they happen to cross the state line. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it wasn't that many years ago in law enforcement. As a law enforcement officer, there were certain states that I couldn't carry my weapon in. And I had to know that before we traveled. They gave us a sheet like this with all exceptions across what states a certified law enforcement officer could carry a weapon in, a concealed weapon. And, you know, this body came across and, and, and allowed active law enforcement and retired, which I am, the ability to carry uh, in every state. Uh, if I have a legal or if I have the ability to do that because of my agency or my state allows me to do that. Um, it just seems that when you can make it accessible to folks that legally have done, crossed all, you know, the T's and, and dotted the I's to do the right thing, that we don't want to make criminals out of them because they happen to go to Georgia from Florida. Uh, whether or not they currently have a reciprocity agreement but it more likely, this just, I think, levels the playing field in regards to folks understanding their rights, particularly constitutional right. Um, is, what's the, 
you know, I've heard a lot of negatives, and we, we heard about this from some of the uh, folks saying that this is an overreach by the federal government in regards to collecting names and addresses of those that currently have a permit. Is that true? The yeah, federal government has very little to do with it. Uh, it's a uh, matter of reciprocity, as we've talked about today, uh, coming up with a uniform uh, measure that applies equally to all states and um, recognizing the fundamental right to bear arms. So the federal government does not have access to it, my concealed weapons permit. That's correct. Well, and this law does, and this this legislation does not give them that right. Is that correct? No, it does not. That's correct. Let me, let me just say that if you believe that more people having concealed weapons will reduce crime, then this is probably a good bill. If you believe that more people carrying firearms is probably more likely to commit, create um, mayhem and cause more crime, then it's a bad bill. I mean, I think this is basically where we're going to end up. If you believe that uh, uh, Professor Lott's uh, research that says the more people carrying more people carrying guns will reduce crime. Um, I think a lot of us just don't believe in that research. With, with the gentleman from Florida yield, absolutely. I, I think it's a significant question that the gentleman from Virginia gives on whether you know more guns uh, creates more crime or fewer guns creates more crime. But what I thought I heard you say was a distinction in that number. So that number is simply not an absolute. The sheriff in my largest county once told me that it's not the legal guns that are going to get him, it's the illegal guns Absolutely that are going to get right. him. So if we take the matrix that Representative Scott was talking about, should that not be subdivided then between if more legal guns are on there versus more illegal guns, and that should be the matrix in which we discuss? You know, most of the deaths I've seen was because they were legally possessed to start with. Uh, you know, they committed a crime with the handgun. That's law. I mean, the law is clear in regards to you can't shoot somebody, you can't rob somebody, you can't use a handgun in, in the commission of the crime. And does that still occur? Does it occur in Illinois? Well, let me just say that the evidence I've seen shows that more, if you have a gun, you're more likely to kill somebody that's innocent than somebody that's committing a, than preventing a crime. Well, I will tell you, the first homicide I ever investigated as a rookie cop did not involve a handgun. It involved an iron pipe that bludgeoned somebody. So it wasn't a handgun. Any tool can be utilized to kill somebody, whether it's a kitchen knife, whether it's a handgun, whether it's a pipe, whether it's a bottle. So, you know, if someone is going to legally go through the process to get fingerprinted to, to receive a concealed weapons permit, I don't quite draw the linkages that they're going to commit a crime because the evidence shows that they don't. Is that true? Like I said, the evidence I've seen shows that the more handguns you have, the more people, including innocent people, will die. Well, that's... And, 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 and you know, if you believe that more handguns will... more people carrying handguns will reduce crime, then we, that's where we disagree. Well, I'm just thinking that if I legally possess a concealed weapons permit, mm -hmm. what I want to make sure is that the person that has, that has gone through the steps to get a legal concealed weapons permit happens to stray across the straight, uh, state line, that they're not now committing a crime. Um, I mean, that's my well, point you, of this. You, it's you, not you, about you have, allowing you, people started, to carry more you, guns. You've started with the um, assumption that you're going to go through some Georgia-like process and not uh, sign up over the internet and get it get it mailed to you. Well, currently, and, is there and, and, is there and, any and, state and, currently is there any state you can do that with? Um, the evidence during the testimony at the hearing was unclear, but there's certainly no nothing in the bill that prohibits a state from dealing them out over the internet. But <laughs> but there's no state currently allowing that. Is that correct? Uh, there was unclear during the hearing. It was unclear. I don't. I, I'm not sure. Sheriff, would you yield again? I absolutely will. Um, as I under the assumption, I'm going to ask you, as you've le looked at this bill, is that this bill deals with reciprocity, not necessarily the minimum standard for gaining a permit in the first in the right. first place. 
nor do I know. In fact, Utah was one of the other states somebody mentioned might be able to do it by permit. We call it shall permit, not must, but it's the same thing. And no, you cannot do that. But the question I actually had goes back to what your testimony was. The issue here is, as the gentleman was saying, is that more guns you have, the more, more crime that will take place. I thought what I heard you say is the distinction. The more illegal guns you may have, if we do a fast and furious program in the United States, the more illegal guns you may have, that may have the result. But the more legal guns, and this was a result of Dr. Lott's study, the more legal guns you have does not increase the crime rate. It's only the illegal guns. And as I think one of the other things that was pointed in his work that you just mentioned there, is actually more people are killed by knives than they are by guns. Which if you want to use the analogy that was just given out, we should take away all the butter knives in America and that will make us all safer. There is a strat, there is a difference between a legal gun and an illegal gun and this bill is dealing with legal weaponry. And I'm, I'm asking as a material, as an expert witness as a sheriff, am I wrong with that? No, you're not. The, you know, the issue is the action that you utilize when you have, whether it's a handgun, a shotgun, a butter knife or whatever, it's, it's the actions that you take that commits the crime. It's, it's not that, it's not the handgun doesn't act on its own, it's the person that has it. So, the, so to take your assumption, I guess, is to say that you want to eliminate all weapons, any, any shotgun, any rifle, any pistol in America. That's the next leap. No, I just said that, uh Increasing the number of firearms, in my judgment, will not reduce the crime rate. Does this increase the, my question then is, does this increase would, the number would, of firearms would the, manufactured in the United States? Well, it, it increases the number of people that can be carrying them from all over, from, from all over the country. Well, I, I, if they already have a permit in Florida or Georgia, they couldn't get how does that permit, increase? If they could not get a permit in their home state. See, this, this, you, can, you can have a situation where you are ineligible because of your criminal record or other behavior. You didn't get any training. Ineligible to get a permit in your home state. You can go to some other state, Utah, and, um, and get a permit, and that permit is good everywhere except your home state. So you can wander all over the country with that permit. And if you think that's going to reduce crime, fine. I, I, I don't think so. Well, the gentleman. Yeah, I'd be glad to yield to my friend. But, but to be clear, Mr. Scott, that is the law of the land today, is it not? If you leave Illinois and you go to Florida and you get a non-resident permit in Florida, you can carry that handgun anywhere across the country today no. that Florida has reciprocity. Uh, yeah, yeah, they have reciprocity. But that is a decision Florida makes is who they have reciprocity with. If a state doesn't come up to their standards. Absolutely. But the non-citizen of Florida, Florida still has the right today to give or still right. has the ability and, and, to and and give they also have the And they also have the right not to recognize um, concealed weapon permit from states that they do not believe come up to their standards. They don't, if they don't want people untrained wandering around with uh, concealed weapons, they don't have to recognize that permit and that, by not giving uh, reciprocity. That's the law today, but this would override that. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Scott, Mr. Webster. Gentlemen, thank you both very much for being here. Appreciate your time and uh, your testimony. Uh, next, we'd like to uh, take a panel consisting of, let's see here, I, the, the members we have uh, here in the room, Mr. Nadler, Ms. Jackson Lee, uh, Mr. Hastings, Mr. Johnson, and Ms. Maloney. So please come forward and uh, please pull a chair forward, Mr. Smith and Mr. Scott. Uh, Mr. Johnson, uh, would you wish to testify? When, uh, please pull the, take the chair up, and we'll, we're, we're asking you to join here at this uh, panel. So please pull your chair forward to the table here, Mr. Johnson. Just, just you can pull your chair right up to the table. And uh, does that uh, cover everyone? Let's uh, begin with uh, Mr. Nadler, and then Ms. Jackson Lee, and then we'll proceed to uh, Mr. Hastings, Mr. Johnson, and Ms. Maloney. Mr. Nadler, let me say that uh, I see you have a beautifully prepared statement. With considerable changes. Uh, with considerable changes, and I know that since you made those changes, you're well aware of them, I'd like to say without objection that entire statement is going to appear in the record, and we would welcome your summary. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, 
I will admit the first, I would submit the statement, I will admit the first part of the statement which uh, basically describes why the bill is a terrible bill. But let me uh, just address the part, uh, um, um, uh, the amendments. With respect to guns, the concerns of more urbanized states like New York are different from those of more rural states like Alaska. Within reason, there are strong reasons to allow each state to tailor its own gun laws to its own unique situation. And that has been our general policy for hundreds of years, and anyone who talks about states' rights ought to adhere to that. Under this bill, that would all change. Anyone with a permit to carry a concealed handgun could bring their gun into any state of which they are not a resident, regardless of whether or not they would even be allowed to possess a firearm if they were a resident of the latter state. Rules that the non-resident state might have prohibiting criminals, alcoholics, young people, or anyone else from having a gun would be overridden. And more specifically, any person with a permit from one state could conceal a handgun in any state of which they are not a resident, regardless of whether they have met that state's rules and requirements for concealed carry. So I'm here today to stand up for the rights of my state of New York and of states across the country. Right now, for example, New York and California prohibit persons convicted of certain misdemeanor sex offenses against minors from even possessing a firearm. Also, some states, like Utah, prohibit persons with misdemeanor sex convictions from getting a concealed carry permit. My First Amendment would enable a state to enforce its own concealed carry laws regarding uh, people convicted of a misdemeanor sex offenses against minors. Without my amendment, the underlying bill would force states to accept dangerous people carrying concealed guns in their midst. I don't think the chairman's home state of California would appreciate that, nor would my state of New York. So to repeat, what this amendment would do would be to say that regardless of the bill, a state could enforce a law against allowing a, someone convicted of a misdemeanor sex offense against a minor from having a concealed, from using a concealed carry permit in that state. So if you had a concealed carry permit from Arizona and, it, and you were a convicted sex offender against a minor, New York can enforce its law against letting you have a concealed carry, per, use a concealed carry permit in New York. That's the First Amendment. The goal of the Second Amendment is to combine a national security threat, is to combat a national security gap threat known as the terror gap. As the member of Congress who represents Ground Zero, I'm keenly aware of the harm that terrorists can do to our country. That is why this whole in our security concerns me so greatly. The terror gap refers to the people, to the loophole in our national gun laws that allows known or suspected terrorists to buy guns in the United States. The reasoning as to why we have such a policy is beyond me. And this is a gap that we know is being exploited. According to the GAO, of the 1,453 people found to be on the terrorist watch list when they were trying to buy guns or explosives between February 2004 and December 2010, 1,321 were allowed to proceed with the purchase. That's a success rate of 91% of known terrorists purchasing guns. The result of this gap in security have been serious and deadly. We all remember the tragedy when Major Nidal Hassan killed 13 people wounded 30 at Fort Hood. While he had been investigated for suspicious activities by the FBI, he was not stopped from buying a weapon. And the fact of the purchase was never shared with the FBI. My colleague from New York, Representative Peter King, the chairman of the Homeland Security Committee, has introduced legislation to close the terror gap, and I am proud to be a co-sponsor of his bill. My Second Amendment is modeled in his proposal and would empower the Attorney General to deny the ability of a known or suspected terrorist, someone on the terrorist watch list, for example, who, had, who possesses a firearm, it would deny him the ability to use H.R. 822 to authorize concealed carry into another state. I would humbly suggest that preventing terrorists from carrying concealed weapons across state lines is a worthwhile goal. As I said when I began, I think the bill is a serious mistake, but if we are to consider it on the House floor, at least I believe members should have the opportunity to make improvements. These two amendments represent such improvements by protecting states' rights and national security I ask them that he be made. I ask that Thank you be very much, uh, Mr. Nader. Thank you again Jackson for the opportunity Lee. to testify. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, let me thank the uh, members of the Rules Committee for their indulgence. Uh, quickly, I'll just um, uh, illuminate some facts and move quickly to my amendments one, two, and three, uh, number two having been revised and it's before the committee. Thirty-eight states do not issue permits to people who have been convicted of certain violent misdemeanors. Thirty-six states do not issue permits to people on the age of 21. And 36 states require gun safety training, often including live fire drills, other proof of competency, 
with a firearm. It shows distinctive differences among states. However, H.R. 822 carries a system of two separate standards for concealed carrying, one that applies to residents of a state and a less restrictive standard that applies to visitors uh, from out of states. Many states will be impacted, but Colorado, California, Virginia, my state of Texas, New York, Massachusetts, South Carolina, Florida, among those who will be impacted by the differences in this law. I know that <clears throat> many of us um, have heard the phrase, uh, people kill, guns don't, but people use guns to kill, and the ultimate result is that people are dead. Uh, my uh, First Amendment uh, is a simple process to aid uh, our law enforcement officers, who all of us have been citing as who we would like to protect along with our citizens. Uh, my amendment ensures that a comprehensive database is implemented which provides a listing of individuals from each state which with permits and licenses to possess and carry concealed weapons be available to law enforcement officers from all states 24 hours a day. Without a national system to check who can legally carry a concealed gun, even routine situations like traffic stops could become life-threatening. Even as I heard the discussion that it is not the concealed weapons permit holders that kill, we don't know the uh, mental conditions or the occurrences that happen to people who legitimately have a concealed weapon. If an officer discovered a gun, they would have to quickly and accurately determine whether the out-of-state permit was valid. And that is, of course, if the officer stops the car and wants to search or asks the individual to provide uh, any weapons that they might have or comes upon it in a search. This is a nearly impossible task in the middle of what could be a tense, dangerous situation. Some state permits look as simple as a library card and would be just as easy uh, to forge. Reciprocity could also obstruct law enforcement efforts to stop illegal gun trafficking. I hope uh, my colleagues on the um, Rules Committee will see uh, the merit of including my amendment. That's amendment number one. Uh, amendment number two uh, deals with the uh, issue of s providing notice to the designated state agency uh, that an individual is coming into that state and carrying a gun. States must retain their ability to know which individuals are allowed under this newly proposed bill uh, to possess and carry concealed weapons within their borders. This measure will require an individual to notify out of state law enforcement 24 hours in advance of their intention to possess or carry a concealed weapon into the borders of that state, in which those individuals are not licensed. Again, it will be the designated state agency that will be notified, uh, and that is amendment number two. Uh, in my home state, uh, we are mourning the death of Cruz Rojas, Mrs. Cruz Rojas, a mother of three, whose security uh, employed officer as a security officer. We've heard of the mall cop. That was a friendly person, uh, but this is one of the security officers. Came to her dental assistant job, uh, pointed a gun through the glass, fired three shots, jumped over the counter, and then fired more shots at her then fallen body. Three children are orphaned. I make the point because I'm also apologetic for my state. Court records show Mr. Sousa was charged with beating Ms. Cruz Rojas in Harris County in February 2009, but the misdemeanor assault charge was dropped after he completed domestic abuse class. I'm appalled at that. But he was still carrying a gun. He still had a job and he was able to kill a mother of three children. My third amendment simply says, even though Texas has a robust handgun concealed carry laws, I would ask that this measure would enforce a minimum standard for gun possession. Texas, uh, that would be a standard to include uh, that you could not have a uh, concealed weapon if you were convicted of stalking or electronic surveillance. Uh, this may be a bipartisan bill with a number of supporters there obviously is disagreement, and many of us do believe that the enhanced number of guns can contribute uh, to the death of innocent individuals. Mr. Sohas uh, left with his gun and stole a boat in Florida. I assume he did not indicate that he was carrying a gun from another state. I think my amendments are common Thank sense amendments, much, and I would ask that Thank they be included much. and made in order. Thank you very much. Without I objection, Mr. Hastings' statement will be made uh, in included in the record. Thank you. Mr. Deutsch's statement will, without objection, be included in the record. Mr. Johnson and then Ms. Uh, Maloney. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. This committee I'm going to be mercifully and practically short. I'll you, this, uh, without objection, it will be included in the record. The amendment is to 
germane. You want to take the microphone there from, uh, I know it's. Yeah. The amendment is germane, certainly an issue that needs to be addressed. I would suggest more, more than likely we'll have substantial support this. The NRA supports it. Uh, Illinois is the only state in the union that would be uncovered by this bill. This clarifies that Illinois will be covered by this bill. I think it's uh, simple rights, uh, privileges, and immunities of our state, which unfortunately, as uh, my colleague's apologizing for her state, I'll apologize for mine. We don't have a law. Nonetheless, this just puts us in the situation the same as any other state and saves a lot of confusion, provides for uniform laws. I think it's extraordinarily important to be able to buttress the bill with this amendment, and I ask its adoption. Thank you. Let me just say for the record that I don't like everything that's done there, but I never apologize for California. Um, Ms. Uh, Maloney. Only in the limited context of failure to act in this area do I apologize for my fine state of Illinois. And I did owe your comments. I'm very proud of Texas, but not looking at a lot of domestic problems. Mr. Mr. Chairman and members of the committee, I request a unanimous consent to place my full comment. Oh, it's comment. included in the record, and we look forward. <laughs> and I, I specifically want to point out one of my amendments that would prohibit an individual convict, convicted of a felony whose gun rights have been restored in his or her state of residence from getting a reciprocity in another state. And uh, on the front page of today's New York Times, they highlight the ease with which uh, felons are able to regain gun rights in certain states. And it points out that uh, in some cases it has led to violent uh, uh, repeat actions that have hurt people. And we simply cannot allow violent criminals to travel freely between states with concealed weapons. So I respectfully request that this amendment be placed in, 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 in order, and I, I say that the people of my home state of New York have every reason to believe that our gun laws uh, work considerably better for us than those of other states. And I go back to the statement of Mrs. Slaughter earlier on Arizona, which has some of the most per permissive gun laws in the country. And according to one report, there were 15 gun deaths per 100,000 people in Arizona, while in New York there are only five gun deaths per 100,000 persons. And that's a pretty stark difference. Uh, so my state, and certainly other states, may not want felons that have a record of violence, of murder, of killing, of uh, other v felony actions to be able to come into our state. And I think Thank that's a reasonable uh, request. I also, as uh, one who represents uh, families that lost 500 loved ones on 9-11, uh, speak in, in support of Mr. Nadler's, um, uh, which would prevent known or suspected terrorists from carrying concealed firearms across state lines. We certainly should not let known terrorists carry firearms across state lines. Uh, and, and to have that checked uh, with the central uh, area is very important. And I want to point out that earlier, um, when we passed the 9-11 terrorist attacks uh, screening uh, uh, bill, the, the, uh, the one that provided health care and monitoring to, to those who are sick and dying because of 9-11, there was an amendment that said that all of these survivors and victims should be checked against the 9-11 terrorist attacks list. So if you're going to check the police and fire who went in to protect each other, to protect our citizens against the terrorist attack list, let's check other known terrorists against the terrorist attack list and not let them uh, freely walk across state lines uh, where they are known to have danger and harm to American citizens. Thank you. Thank you very and much. And I have others that uh, really talk to the, the need to hire more police officers. Right. If you're going to be having people coming in with concealed weapons that can be terrorists, that can be felons. We will need more police officers on the street. And uh, other amendments uh, address that and the, and the fact that we need to really look at the unemployment problems we confront. Thank you very much, but, Ms. Uh, Maloney. <clears throat> are, there any, are there any questions? Are there any questions of the, uh, of the witnesses here? If not, thank you all very much for being here. We appreciate your very thoughtful like testimony. This article in the paper. Yes, and without objection, the article Mr. Hastings referred to it earlier in the hearing. It will be included in the record. And that will conclude the hearing uh, for consideration of H.R. 822. And the uh, chair will be in receipt of a motion. Excuse us if our clerk could get to the uh, desk here, Mr. Nadler and Ms. Jackson Lee. Thank you both very much for being here. Chair will be in receipt of a motion. Mr. Chairman, I move the committee report a structure rule for consideration of H.R. 822, the National Right to Carry Reciprocity Act of 2011. The rule provides 
One hour of general debate equally divided and controlled by the chair and ranking minority member of the Committee on Judiciary. The rule waives all points for or against consideration of the bill. Rule provides that the amendment in the nature of a substitute recommended by the Committee on the Judiciary now printed in the bill shall be considered as original text for the purpose of amendment and shall be considered as read. The rule waives all points for or against the Committee's amendment in the nature of a substitute. The rule makes an order only those amendments printed in the Rules Committee report. Each such amendment may only be offered in the order printed in the report, may only be offered by a member designated in the report, and shall be considered as read, shall be debatable for the time specified in the Report equally divided and controlled by the proponent and opponent shall not be subject to amendment, shall not be subject to a demand for division of the question. The rule waives all points for orders against consideration of amendments printed in the report. Finally, the rule provides one motion to recommit with or without instruction. You've heard the motion, General. Let me just say that uh, obviously, as we've seen today, this is an issue that brings out uh, very strongly held beliefs. We, uh, with this rule, are proposing to make an order ten amendments, eight amendments offered by Democrats, two amendments offered by Republicans. And uh, are there any amendments to the rule? Mr. McGovern. Uh, Mr. Chairman, there are many amendments that haven't been made in order, and I would move that the committee report an open rule for consideration of H.R. 822 so that all members have the opportunity to offer amendments. Thank to the you bill. very much, Mr. McGovern. The vote occurs on the McGovern Amendment. Those in favor will say aye. Aye. Those opposed, no. Yes. No. That's for roll call. Clerk, call the roll. Mr. Sessions. No. Mr. Sessions, no. Ms. Fox. No. Ms. Fox, no. Mr. Bishop. Mr. Bishop, no. Mr. Woodall. No. Mr. Woodall, no. Mr. Nugent. Mr. Nugent, no. Mr. Scott, no. Mr. Scott, no. Mr. Webster, no. Mr. Webster, no. Ms. Slaughter, Mr. McGovern, aye. Mr. McGovern, aye. Mr. Hastings, aye. Mr. Hastings, aye. Mr. Polis, aye. Mr. Polis, aye. Mr. Chairman, no. Mr. Chairman, no. And the clerk will report the total. Three yeas, eight nays. And the motion is not agreed to. There are further amendments. <laughs> Mr. Hastings. Mr. Chairman, uh, I offer as one motion uh, the amendments uh, number 12 by Mr. Nadler and uh, the number eight by Mr. Bishop, and I believe the committee members know what they are, and I won't offer any uh, words in support of saying. Vote occurs on the Hastings Amendment. Those in favor will say aye. aye. Those aye. opposed, no. Pay well, the chair the no's have it. The Mr. clerk will call the roll. Mr. Sessions. No. Mr. Sessions, no. Ms. Fox. No. Ms. Fox, no. Mr. Bishop. No. Mr. Bishop, no. Mr. Woodall. No. Mr. Woodall, no. Mr. Nugent. No. Mr. Nugent, no. Mr. Scott. Scott, no. Mr. Webster. No. Mr. Webster, no. Ms. Slaughter. Mr. McGovern. Aye. Mr. McGovern, aye. Mr. Hastings. Aye. Mr. Hastings, aye. Mr. Polis. Aye. Mr. Polis, aye. Mr. Chairman. No. Chairman, no. And the clerk will report the total. Three yeas, eight nays. And the motion is not agreed to. Are there further amendments? If not, the vote occurs in the motion of the gentleman from Dallas. Those in favor will say aye. Aye. Those opposed, no. And pay the chair. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. The motion is agreed to. And this will be handled by Mr. Nugent for the majority. And Mr. McGovern. And Mr. McGovern from the Nority. Thank you all very much. We'll look forward to seeing you at tomorrow's meeting.